Yeah, I was at Campbell College of Art. Um, I think I applied in 91. Right. And then uh, got in at 92. And when you go, you have, it's nine months. Yeah. And so Campbell College is in Peckham, so South London. It's um, really quite well known. It's part of the university colleges. So you've got St. Martin's. Yeah. Um, and you've got other UCLs. You've got University College of Farnham, which I, after I did my on my foundation, I did my degree in Farnham, what was then called just Farnham College. Um, and uh, and then that became um, Farnham College of Art, then West Surrey College of Art. Now it's part of UCL, part of the, the University College of Arts. Um, Camberwell um, was an existing uh, one in, in London next to St. Martin's. I'd only ever really heard of St. Martin's. That was the one I really wanted to get into. Okay. Um, uh, because it was known for um, really good teachers, uh, really good lectures, and a good uh, uh, student life. Right. So I was like, wow, some minds, got to get some minds, got to get some minds. And um, applied, and I, for whatever reason, I couldn't get in. But they said, well, Camberwell's uh, cool. Why don't you try Camberwell? And that was my second um, sort of introduction. I had a look and thought, oh, I like this. There's, they've got really good drawing rooms. The tutors seem quite good. Um, there was a guy called Clive Garland, um, who's still an artist now. And um, uh, we were very different. He was a real hippie and I was a bit more moddy. Um, but okay. he was quite good at, uh, um, he could talk art and he could say, oh, you want to look at so-and-so or you want to check this person out. Um, at one, one stage, I was doing what I thought was unique work that nobody had ever done before. And I think most artists go through this. Mm. I was like, yeah, this is good. I think I've got this. And I was doing mosaics. I was like manipulating pictures. And then I was painting these mosaic images, these portraits of um, of myself and my friends. And a lot of my early work was about my adoption. So it was about self-reflecting and, and, um, and just looking at myself internally, really. And... Um, Clive said, hmm, uh, have you heard of uh, Chuck, Chuck Close? And I went, I don't know, no. And at that stage, actually, Stuart, I hadn't known, I didn't know any artists, really. Right. And I went, is he dead? And he went, no, no, he's very much alive. He's, okay. he's one of the biggest American contemporary, um, he was a realist artist in the 70s, 60s and 70s, but... Um, He's doing sort of similar work as you. You may well, there's one book in the library you might want to check it out. I went mean, okay, yeah. And I found this book and it destroyed me. <laughs> it's basically, um, he, you know, he discovered that in the early seventies about mucking around with color, mosaic and images, so pixelating, basically pixelating images, yeah. blowing up pixels, and so you really only see the image from quite way away. Yeah. The nearer you walk towards the picture, the 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 more it kind of breaks up and you can't see it. So. Yeah. Uh, he'd done it so he was he was actually someone I looked at and um, uh, and I thought was was uh, you know a pretty good artist to look at actually yeah, it's interesting you said that about the mosaics I'm looking at the ones behind you yes um, I think yeah. the first time I, I spoke to you was probably about was probably about nine years ago yeah something like in, that yeah. I walked in mm. and I remember we got talking about all manner of things and it was obvious you had you know you had a, a wealth of, of of knowledge regarding many different types of art music all sorts yes um, which, yeah, I, yeah. which was really good it was really <laughs> nice to have a conversation with you yeah when um, you get a connection sometimes it's yeah. easy it's just um yeah. it's just a flow really um yeah and i do remember you coming i have a lot of people in the door i mean i open my studio now uh, pretty much every other Saturday. But back then I, I didn't open it that much. You know, I was still doing work, doing the odd commission and um, still working out what I, or how I wanted to paint. I mean, you never get to the end of that one. It's always going to be a bit of a quandary. But yeah. but when I do open the door, you never know who's going to come in. And, and, you know, when, as you know, when you live in, in Crystal Palace in South London, you know, you throw a tennis ball down the high street and it's going to bounce off a poet um, a writer, an actor, a photographer. Someone's going to be doing something that's going to be either uh, they're doing it professionally or they're semi-professional, um, but they're creative because there seems to be a kind of migration to be, being quite creative and it ends up around this area, I think. And, not, I, really didn't, I really didn't know how, how it mm. was that sort of vibrant, really, to be honest with you. I sort of live under a rock, I guess. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it is surprising because you... You get in a conversation someone said, well, have you spoken to so-and-so? And I go, no. 
Oh, they're an artist, are they? Yeah, yeah, they're only down the road. Oh, right. Have you got their number? Yeah. So I'll call them and they'll go, oh, I didn't know. How long have you been here? And I'll go, I've been here four years. And they'll go, well, I've been here six years. And I, that still happens. I've now been here nine, to about 11 years. 11 years, yeah. And um, uh, I'm, I still get people in the door and I can kind of tell when they're looking at my stuff. You just get a feeling when they start talking about something. You think, oh, they know a bit about art or they follow art. They're not necessarily artists, yeah. but they follow art. So in other words, they've got a bit of a discerning eye. And then I go, oh, do you, do you paint or draw or anything like that? And and nine times out of ten, there'll be some connection where they'll say, oh, well, I've done a bit of painting or, um, oh, yeah, I love the history of art. So I follow the history of art and I like this artist and and um, you're working in a similar sort of vein. And and then and then there's um, then that's when a good, interesting conversations come. And um, uh, I guess for you, in a similar way, I'm interested in people. So because yeah. I like. I do a lot of portrait work. I look at people. So I'm hardwired to just look. And if I'm interested and thinking, well, you're a little bit different, or are there something behind your eyes? I don't know what it is, but I'm quite interested. Then, and you must have that as well, because being a photographer and, you know, not only it's places, it's people as well that kind of really get you. Yeah, I think I, I learned a lot by photographing you, to be honest with you. No, right. <laughs> and, okay, and, yeah, talk, yeah. and talking to you on that day, actually. Mm. Um and yeah, you just talking through the process, which I'm really interested in, mm. in, in all manner of arts, really, the mindset and yes, and and the heart as well. You know, I think it's well, they go together, and I think if you haven't got that, you, you know, I um, a chap came in, I won't name him, but a chap came into the studio years ago, and he he was liking my work, and he was really infused, and he said, um. Yeah, yeah, I want to be famous. I want to be famous artist, and uh, you know, and I want to achieve, you know, all these things like you and whatever. <laughs> I just say, I go, whoa, 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 wait there. I said, uh, number one, right, whatever you do, you got to like it. So, I, 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 for a start, I only ever, I've drawn and painted. It's what I do. So I'm, uh, it, it's in me. So it's a bit like he, he, if I don't draw or paint. Uh, or do something during the week that's creative that involves me using my hands, getting getting paint, yep. even reading art. I get the DTs. I start to feel a bit wobbly, and I seriously have that. It is a bit like you know you're on a jug. I want to get on with it. I've got some ideas, and I do things. That's what you need. That's that's what you've got first of all. You've got a heart. You've got to have that. Well, anything else is a plus. Anything else, if you if you decide that you um want to be famous then you know what you're chasing dragons because yeah, a lot of that is luck yeah. it's who you meet and you know Stuart you came in and liked my work and we had a good chat and that was and that was perfect and at uh, certain levels we both got off on that and went well yeah that's really good I really learned a lot of stuff mutually we liked each other's work and now since seen your your photography and and I, I have your photos on my website I love them thank you and I and I think what it is is part of that is because it's in you and it's it's what you do. Number one, if anyone sees your work and then they go, do you know what? We're going to have a group exhibition. We're interested in. What, do you want to do you want to show with us? Then um, yeah, if I'm not doing anything, if I look at the work and I like the, the level work, I mean I don't say yes to everything. You have got to be a bit careful because you want yeah. your work to sing out and look. Are just as good with others you know yeah. so there's a certain level and a quality which i now i now i see like as a younger fellow i wasn't so much and i try and go for every, anything that's not necessarily a bad thing when you're starting get your work seen it's getting eyes on your work and the thing is you know if people aren't looking at your work then you don't have eyes on your work so you haven't got a voice the way you have a voice is you get it out there and it's a bit of a game as we know Stuart. is yeah. that you have to start you have to put things on the internet. You have to um, uh, go on Insta, do an Insta. You've got your Facebook. You've got to do all those things. And they say to you for social media, you've got to keep doing it. You've got to be doing it uh, at least once a day and be liking other people's work. And that's actually quite a good thing. Easy, easy click. Yeah. Well, Stuart, like your work, click on there, follow you. If I like a photo that you've done, I might go, we like that photo and I might comment on it. Now, someone else in the planet may look at that and go who's martin jessup who's following stuart yeah and they'll go oh okay this guy martin jessup he's a he's a he's an artist what does he do oh we might they might like my work and then they follow me so it's, it's a numbers game then it comes up but i think yeah the first and foremost just get on with the work 
do the work because the work's important. And um, fame is one of those things where sometimes it can happen and sometimes it can't. An example to give is um, an artist that I really rate called Jenny Savile, who's yep. a contemporary artist. Jenny Savile, amazing woman. She went to St. Martin's, I think. I don't, I don't think she was at Camberwell. And um, uh, she was around about the same time as um, Damien Hurst and all those people, maybe a little bit afterwards. Anyway, she had a degree show, and whilst her degree paintings, her old paintings, were up, she sold two paintings. That's not that unusual, you know, if people like your work. And actually, I sold a couple of paintings on my degree show. Yeah. And um, of course, part of that's good because you're like, you've got no money, you're about to leave college, and you want people to know you. So, and then people who like art, they go to um, foundation classes, which is a good thing to do. And you look at photographers, and you look at painters, and you look at sculptors, and you look at fashion um, designers. Yeah. And you can get really good stuff for low money. You can walk out with sculpture, ceramic, paintings for really good prices. The students are pleased because they've sold their work and they're, they're you know, that gives them a sense of pride. Um, but then, uh, you know, equally, you're getting, you're getting an early Jessup or an early, you know, yeah, PT or whatever it is, you know. So um, it's a good thing to, to, to sell your work. Someone left their number in her space. Um, when she called it, the story goes um, uh, that it was, um, oh, I'm just trying to think the name of the um, gallery owner of the um, oh, the White Gallery. Um, I, I forget it now. It'll come to me. Yep. But anyway, this guy who's like, um, uh, you know, first show Damien Hurst's work, he said, um, I've got, uh, I like your paintings. Um, can I buy them? Uh, when she said, uh, yeah, one minute, I, uh, I've already sold them. He said, well, who did you sell them to? So Jenny Savile said, oh, I sold, gave, gave him the address. He then contacted him, and being a gallerist and, and, collecting art, and collecting artists, he re-bought the artwork for a large price, okay. these two paintings. So he got early, two very early, Jenny Savills. He then arranged for her to come to the gallery. When she came to the gallery, there was two massive white rooms with nothing in. And he said to her, I'm giving you two years. Two years, I want you to, um, if you can, uh, fill up the, the gall my gallery with your paintings. Wow. She was only 19, 20, round about that age. Yeah. She went, yeah, all right. And, and her, in her own words, she kind of had the balls because she was like, well, I want to, I want to share my work. I think I've got something to say. And she was pretty fearless. And part of that was ignorance because she just thought, well, I think I can do it. But she didn't really know. Yeah. But within two years, she had a body of work and um, she exhibited. And from then on, I think that, you know, that's where she got, uh, that's where she got known very early on and how she seriously has become famous. She's one of our leading biggest um, artists, never mind being female or male. I always... Um, feel funny about the word when you say artist with your male or female I mean at the end thing is you're just an artist yep. whether you, you, know, you happen to be female or male or trans or whatever you want to call yourself um, she she got seen very early on that is luck you know yeah. and I haven't had someone come in and go yeah. oh well I want an early Martin Jessup but well you know what as long as I'm selling work um and doing my paintings and you know i have as someone pointed out about seven or eight years ago i was well i was thinking am i an artist someone said marty yeah at the moment i'm in your studio so you have a studio you're surrounded by your own work and yeah. you're painting you're actually working on something and you've just sold something so if that's not being an artist do tell me what is being an artist and i had no answer because actually he was right and you kind of do feel in a sense, am I being, um, oh, what's that term when people use when you're... Imposter syndrome. Yeah, imposter syndrome. Am I, am I, I'm saying I'm an artist. Now, I've never had trouble, um, actually for, for quite a few years, say, I'm an artist. I'm not afraid of the word artist. But you, actually, you'll come across quite a lot of artists, and maybe you have, uh, they go, no, I'm not an artist. They go, oh, I'm a painter. Oh, yeah, yeah, I draw. Yeah, I don't really like to call myself an artist. And they float around the issue. 
I'm quite happy to say I'm an artist because that's what I do and that's what I've done since I was, you know, I can pick up a crayon and and scrawl on a wall, which is what I, I did when I was a kid. Yeah, yeah. You know, you get used to, as long as you've got something that makes a mark and something you can mark onto, that's when your life begins. And I was lucky enough to find that at an early age. And, so, and I don't know about you, Stuart, but like when for photography for you, were you always into photography? Not or? necessarily photography, but I liked... Um... I like I like drawing. My mum actually wanted to be an art teacher, oh, right. um, yeah. but she 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 became a housewife. Yeah, and um, I think some of the some of the earliest photographs and some of the memories that I think and I see with myself with like a real smile on my face mm. was sitting with her maybe in the garden on a nice day painting, yeah, wearing an apron or or doing something like that. So yeah, that, those sort of things, um, and then got into yeah, it was obviously interested in vis- the visual arts and film and things like that mm. my grandfather loved old old movie stars and old films and yeah. he, he was into music and he recorded music and he was a carpenter so he's always doing practical things, man practical man doing things with his hands so i was always being taught to do things like that yeah and then watching like glamour yeah yeah and, and my mum was 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 quite a glamorous when she liked her clothes she liked mm. that um so yeah, it was, just, it was that, and then it was getting into music. I had an older brother, getting mm. into music. He was into the arts, into acting, into writing, right. reading, comic. But he's a comic book writer. Um, well, that's part of what he does. Yeah. Um, so you had it all around. It sounds like it was a very rich environment, and you know, and that you've got all these kind of um, things going around you that you can't. You're just um, soaking them in, and and you know. Um, that's a great thing because you know already you you know if you have a love for film you're sitting there with your dad and he's you know watching this black and white movie and I, I was the same with my dad we'd watch all these westerns and Michael Caine films and things like that and and um I, yeah I really liked them and visually I kind of like that kind of style as well and in and in music but um but yeah but to have your 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 dad like in the film side, yep. and it's quite curious because obviously you've got into like film and and photography and and that kind of thing, and then the 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 glam side from your mum, so she is obviously into that kind of side, the way you look, and then that kind of, and that really that is a simple, only a very quick step to to the culture when it comes to music because you know, and in our time with similar sort of ages, yeah. well, you've got all the different stages. One minute, you know, one one year you could be a soul boy. The next minute, you kind of drop that and you get into punk or whatever, and and then um, new wave comes along and hits you, and and there are all these tribes, and you kind of find your way, don't you? You kind of find your feet. Definitely, I mean, I think you you try different things and you listen to different things. Mm. I mean, my taste obviously have changed massively. Yes, not, same not, here, yeah. not any of us. Um, yeah. And I played a lot of music, and obviously playing music, your ear changes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so all, all, all of those sort of things, just little things you pick up on, things that you liked when you were younger. You yeah, know, now you're like, no, that's really garish, you know. Or it's really, <laughs> yeah, there's no class to it whatsoever. Like, like not that yeah. you want to be a snob, but it's like, um, yeah, you just think it, it hits your ear different, and your sense is different. Definitely, and and, and this, uh, I totally um get that because like i say when you're following an artist or maybe maybe you you think it's a bit chocolate box you think i don't really like that um uh vermeer for instance so i've done a copy of a vermeer painting so in in my studio it's called the milkmaid and there's a painting uh, by vermeer and um when i was younger i was like oh man i don't don't you know i'm not interested in painting people do it you're working and that's all very old, old fashioned. And I saw it in books, and it just wasn't my kind of thing. Yeah. But then, actually, when I started to um, learn about art, learn about painting, and especially old painting, you start to have to look at artists. And then, when you're actually at college, they they specifically say to you, you know, check out this artist. This is what they were doing then. This is how they work. This is how they physically made the paint before they can even work. Yeah. You know, now you can just squeeze something out of a tube, but you know, back then you had to make all the pigments and, and that was a slow process and, and that's how you learn about colours and some colours cost more money and you couldn't really afford them and other colours um, can be quite poisonous so you have to be really careful. So I learned all that 
And then I started looking at paintings in a different way. Well, it's a bit like music. I used to listen to some glam stuff. Oh, I wasn't into David Bowie. Okay. Uh, and that's mad because, like, he's absolutely amazing. God rest his soul. But at the time when I was at school, was not interested in David Bowie. Didn't get it. Didn't understand his lyrics. What is he talking about? No, thank you. But now, I think it's absolutely amazing. He was so ahead of his time. Um, incredible guy who was, again, was in a... Uh, you know, uh, what you would say would be an artist in, in every sense of the word. So he wasn't only um, um, a singer, but he was a painter as well. He collected the arts. He had yeah. a huge amount of uh, of artworks, photography, painting, sculpture. Um, and then obviously loved his fashion. So, so and I can appreciate that now. But yeah. you, you couldn't, and, and I guess, yeah, same for you. You'd listen to say and go, well, that's a bit of an extent. Why Why are they, why is that song going on for 19 minutes yeah, when yeah, you yeah. could, you do that in three and a half? Yeah. And now you go, well, you know what, that's pretty good. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, you want to know how or what was he using? Yeah, definitely. Uh, there's there's an interest in, in the way it was made or mm. or, why, or why it's going on like that. And I, I think yeah, even, you know, it's taking photographs as well you look at you look at the the tones of things differently mm. when you've been doing it a little while and you sort of i guess i don't know if it's the same for you painting but obviously your, your color choices and things like that and uh, has that changed uh, it, it has changed yeah. and it does change and um uh yeah so uh, also it depends on the pigment that you use so when i started out i was only sort of going back i was only drawing so did a lot of drawing 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 and then I thought, um, I'd like to have a go at painting. I had a go at watercolour, which is incredibly hard to do. And I didn't really, I wasn't using watercolour. It should be used, which is quite literally fluid, excuse the pun. But it is actually quite, you use it very loosely, try not to be too tight. And you can do lots of tricksy things that look quite good. And um, But it's a very difficult medium uh, for an artist. Uh, some people warm to it, but I don't. I then got um, given a set probably when I was about 11 or 12, an oil painting set, painting by numbers, oil painting set of a seascape. And I can see it now. So I, I opened the pots and I could smell the paint and they had this thing called linseed oil. Yeah. Smelt lovely. But terps, that smelt lovely, but you've got to be a bit careful with terps. And I had all these little pots and I was going, okay, number one, that's white. Number two, oh, that's blue. Okay. And then off I went. I filled in all my numbers on the picture when I completed it however long it took me I had a painting of a seascape and I was really pleased with it and that made me go oh I can do this I mean you know sounds like cheating but you got to start somewhere and that's when I I, I thought well I can have a go at this um, and it was quite a few years later then I I did it again, did more painting with oils. And then I also started to use acrylics. And an acrylic painting, it dries very quickly. It's a, it's what you call a plastic medium. Yeah. So it, yeah, it dries very quickly and it, and it tends to be quite bright colors. Um, so when I was at college at Camberwell, and then when I went and to do my degree, I got being known as a bit of a pop artist because my colors, my palette was really bright. Okay, yeah. I was looking at a lot of artists that really pop their colours. And yeah. a lot of them were using like, um, Peter Blake, people like that were using strong colours straight out of a tube, um, which was at that time just fantastic, you know. Um, I've gone back since then, I've gone back to oils because um, when I'm doing a portrait of someone, I, I can use that sort of butterly sort of quality of colour uh, on paint. I can get all these subtle tones and blend it and it's still wet. Right. So I can do pliable, wet on wet. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And if I don't like it, scrape it off. You know, whereas an acrylic painting, after a while, it's already starting to dry and you have to paint on top of it and it can, you know, be a bit of a nightmare. But I mean, some people now, you know, they swear by acrylic painting and, and they're acrylic artists. Yeah. I'm a um, more traditional and, um, and it has gone back into, my palette has got, slightly more earthier and not as as colourful but in actual fact funny enough telling you this now my, the next idea um, is much more colourful I'm going to do full portraits um, all the sitters are going to be sat down so all, all, all the figures are, are going to be sat yep. and they're and I'm going to be really tuning up the colours so they're going to be quite bright so even though it's going to be very realistically painted it's going to have a slight kind of um psychedelic isn't the word but it definitely a more of a playful side of 
of uh, of working wow. and um uh and that's what you know I've, I've been having a look at other artists and i see some people you know you follow people on instagram i can't remember her name there's a lady and, and her work is purples and oranges and yellows and odd colors yeah which somehow work on the palette yeah and um and i like the way that they're daring enough to go if you're doing someone who's caucasian or might be a little, be a little bit pinky yep. or a little bit orange a little bit orangey or no why well, use that color when you can use you know, a, a deep orange hue or a blue or even a purple or even have the background really colourful or what they're wearing really, really colourful. Um, it becomes a bit more playful then. And yeah. and uh, so that's that's the sort of my colour colour palette change. The last thing I was thinking of is, and I don't quite know how to get here yet, but it's this is where I'm going to do my homework, I guess, and plan it, is um, to do more of a narrative because I'm quite happy to just do a painting of you, like a portrait of you. I, I took some photos of you. Yep. And out of the several po um, photos, one of them was quite a good one. Wow. And you were giving me your steely gaze. Was and that? I thought, this is the Stuart Peaty gaze that I like. I want to try and get behind your eyes <laughs> and paint that. Now, I'm that's intrigued. job done, you see, if I can do that. But if I can do it in a, in a different way, which may be through colour, so people have resonance. They feel different things when they see colours. So, um, how to describe it? So, uh, Rothko, the painter Rothko, yep. who was 60s, 70s, colour field painter, he did big swathes of colour. There were blocks of rectangle colour. So, this is Mark Rothko. Yep. Um, when you look at his work and you stand in his room, it can have quite an emotional effect on you because you, they're in the Tate, um, Tate Britain and one room, some of them, and um, they're quite dark browns, blacks, reds, buzzing colour that are bigger than you you almost they're like doorways of colour um, now they can affect you there are brighter ones and they're very full of the kind of happy resonance about them um, Barnett Newman was a similar painter and some of his works big colour filled bright colour work and I like it it makes me feel happier and and when I see work that's a bit more bright and colourful I kind of like that so making my colour palette a bit brighter but then also a narration, a, 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 have a narrative, have a story. And I haven't quite worked that out. You know, you told me a bit about your past and how it's been a bit tough and you've tried this and you've tried that. And that's great. Um, but getting to know um, know you a bit more, yeah. I, I would like if I was to do a painting of you to seriously um, give you a... Oh, what's the word for it? Um, actually show you how I feel about you and how and 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 to tell the viewer a bit about where you're being and where you're going okay and, and and if you can do that as an artist and some artists can do that really really well mm. then that's great I uh, but it's not an area that I do and there's some artists that solely I mean a political artist so they'll go you know what um uh you know I, I'm really behind um Biden you know I don't like Trump um, you know, so I'm going to do anti-Trump kind of paintings or I'm going to push Biden. So I'm going to push this. Uh, or it might be a, a story of um, third world countries that aren't getting enough food or indeed, you know, wars that are going on, you know. Yeah. Uh, and there were war artists or artists right now that are out there that are sketching and drawing and, and um, you know, um, making up the narrative of what's going on in these different countries. So I feel like as an artist, I'm. it's nice doing pretty pictures. Yeah. And I don't mean that in a derogatory term because I can carry on doing that ad infinitum till up to the end of time with me. But if I can if I can do a story like a um, Picasso's Guernica, when yep. he did Guernica, Guernica was um, a village that just got absolutely bombed by the Nazis, flattened. Many, many people were killed. Horses were killed. Animals were killed. People were killed. And the response from that that was in a newspaper, Picasso saw that, was still living in Paris and did this painting. And it's visceral and it's a kind of black and white two-tone painting. It's massive wall size. And he did that in over a period of a couple of weeks, I think, but it was relatively quick. And um, that's one of the most popular uh, uh, narrative paintings or subject matter of which of something that happened in real life so i'd like to be able to do something like that because i think um 
You know, it's a bit like being a, a writer and artist. You're being informative and you're trying to tell a bit of a story. This is my take on a particular subject and and take it as you will. You know, there's nothing worse than doing an artwork, a painting really, that um, just people walk past. Because if it's not seen or you don't, people don't actually stop and have a look, then my job for them, uh, uh, you know, my work's not for them. It's okay. not for their eyes. Yeah. But I have had people come in the studio and go, oh, wow, and they infuse about saying that I don't even see, but they like it. And I go, well, look, great, that's, you see that. And other times people look at my work and go, yeah, I see that. I, I definitely agree with you. That's what I try to do. Thirdly, I get people to come and they literally look around they're in the doorway and then they turn away and it's not for them because they might be abstract, abstract artists or they might be into more um yeah more abstract feel than, than figuration and figuration being you know doing figure and portrait work is quite old is quite old-fashioned but I, right. it's still relevant i think yeah definitely yeah i do i mean when i look at all the work as well i just think there's a there's a heck of a lot of, of character and a lot of skill as well <laughs> yeah well it yeah. takes I've done my, well a bit like you when it comes to like um, photography and and, um, and music you know you do your 10,000 hours like they, they like to bandy this around and I like to use it do your 10,000 hours and you've got to the point where you pretty much know what you're doing yeah. that doesn't end the problem because I mean the problem is first of all is learning your trade learning what you're interested in and it could be anything um, but I happen to have chosen that I want to want to be an artist and do art at the end of that You've got to be able to, once you do that, you've then got a load of other problems. It's like, well, how I've got, I know now 9, 10, 11, 12, et cetera, different ways of communicating on a 2D canvas or paper um, uh, my art. Mm. And I can do it loads of different ways, but how am I going to do it? You know, so it, um, you know, so there, you, you never stop learning. And, and also you're only as good as maybe your last painting. And in fact, your last painting may not be as good as, the painting you did before, but because you're doing it, you're in that uh, you're in in that moment. You, you know you want to do as good as you can, and and you can learn um, and always learn. But it's it's um it, it's it's an odd thing. It's it's, it's yeah, but you got you know you've got to put the hours in. You can't just say it because um, some people are gobby and they can they can be um, very expressive verbally but I mean and I had some very interesting people that were at college guys and girls that could really talk the talk we were saying earlier about being a bit shy or being reserved and finding your voice whether it's in painting or actually even talking yeah and um, I, there were people at my um, foundation I suddenly looked at and they could just talk it one woman who um, had Asian background a very funny woman actually uh, she could really talk art she knew a bit about the history of art she could talk about your work and go oh i see this and see that and you'd be just looking at her with your jaw jaw drop going wow really that's interesting now mm. i know now with the uh, with the benefit of insight and you know 30 odd years in front of me some of that was a bit bullshit but being able to talk it is quite an interesting thing you have to be able to talk about it, art when someone says to you why have you done that? Or why have you painted that person? Or how have you done that? You've got to have an answer, you know. Um, um, you've got to be knowledgeable from that point of view. So that's why you need you need the hours. You need you need the um, the experience. But it's it's an experience that um, is an artist curse, you know. In that you you do a piece of work, it's in your head, and when you when you create it, maybe like music, you've got it in your head. You get it out, and it's like maybe 90% there, but you never quite hit the point you want. Now, you may have gone to a different route and gone, mm, you know what, I'm actually quite happy with that one because that's turned out better yeah. than what I thought it'd be. Not how you necessarily thought it was going to be, but better. Now, that's a bit like the artist's curse. Yeah, I mean, I've, 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 I often think, I was thinking the other day, just about never, there's, there's times where you feel like you're never quite satisfied, you yeah. know, and you would just want to, I want to improve a bit more. Yeah, yeah. You know, or I want to do that, or I'm I'm a million miles away. Or you listen to something, you go, oh man, that's so much better. Yeah, and right. do you find do you find it's peaks and troughs? Do you find that you're learning chords or or playing a bit of a riff because you're listening and saying, and you're not quite getting. And then one day, without practicing too much or being a, a relaxed enough, you do it. You do it and turn that corner, and you you learn a little bit more. I'm, yeah, uh, definitely. I, I'm I'm pretty bad actually. I don't practice as much as I, I right. don't, not. I don't now, but used to practice. Yeah. and play with play with bands. Mm. And so when I was doing that, 
Yeah, it was just the more the more you did it. There was days where you didn't get it at all, and then it did something. Yeah, something just popped, or you or you found stumbled on something that that just worked, and you realised I've been wasting all my time looking in this direction. Yeah, when it's over there, and that's not what I was really looking for, you know. But that's great because I guess when you're playing in a band or you're rehearsing or you're just in a studio with other, other musicians. Is it the point where you kind of feed off someone? So uh, when you're jamming, literally when you're jamming, are you listening to something? Are you doing something and playing something circular? You know, just doing something, and then someone else joins him in the drums and go, yeah, maybe let's try something like this. And then someone else tries. Is it a bit organic like that? Yeah, most of the time. Yeah. Um, when I was in bands as well, I played drums. That was my that was my instrument that I played. Yeah. Um, and yeah, that was really important. And the thing. Th- just jamming and the ideas and it being organic like that it took work you know sometimes it works with you play with someone once or twice Mm. and and it just works yeah and then you might play with them again and it's not quite as good but Mm. then there's you know i was in bands where we we practiced like regularly and gigged and we worked at it and worked at it and worked at it and you, we got used to our, each other's limitations I think yeah and yeah. I, I think it was just a relationship as well being in a rehearsal room looking around even the volume of the music and the, and as a drummer you get used to right? the, <laughs> the, the, the tone of the cymbal mm. of the way that it cuts through a certain mm. texture or a certain tone or you, you get used to what you're using yeah um, it's like you know if you if you put a particular colour on a black background, I'm sure. You know, oh, yeah, yeah, it sings it's gonna, off it's it. It's going to pop more. Yeah, yeah. Um, That's so interesting, because when you say it that way, see, I really get off listening to people that, that um, you know, sometimes eloquently, that was really eloquent the way you put that, that, you know, you, you're working on something and then, and then um, someone will do something and, and like the level of the drums and so the cymbal, so I'm playing the cymbal and I know it, it reaches this point, it's, a, it's this rich kind of, timber on it you know the sound it works really really well for me when i'm doing a when i put color on sometimes someone said this and it's so true and i only recently discovered this Mm. you put pretty much any color on a gray and it's a particular gray it's like a light gray it looks amazing i'm not saying to everyone look move into your new house paint the walls gray because whatever you put on it or lean against it's going to look amazing but nine times out of ten you'll be surprised you'll go wow i don't know that combination works really well and because grey is such a kind of like meh colour that anything next to it kind of works quite well and I think that's a, that's when we talk about colour balance and, and, and literally how, how one colour is really working against another and and uh, you know uh, the musical colour if you like if you're listening to a cymbal yeah. and you're going I know I can do this and you know and I and, and dr- the drums fascinate me because they are the driving force of any band but it's so funny because you as a drummer, you're at the back. Generally, they stuff you at the back. Yeah. And they and then when, when you're rehearsing as well, I mean, I saw Stone sing. Uh, maybe I also saw the um, the uh, the Beatles sing. But I know, I think I saw it on the Stones um, uh, clip, film clip, where um, they had something that was dampening the drums yeah. to make it... Could, could like go towels, quite, probably. Yeah, towels yeah. and all kinds of things over the... And um, it looked like a cacophony... Uh, this this drum set looked like it was it was dressed, um, <laughs> but it it sounded really good. And then people who use different things like these big brushes you use these big brushes yeah. make this kind of jazzy sound. And and then there's all these different sticks, and it's such a performance. You know when you're twisting sticks and you're doing all that kind of thing. I love it. I could just watch drummers. You know, um, uh, oh, what's she called? Faye, but I can't remember what her last name is. The Savages. Yeah, Faye. Uh, Walter is the drummer yeah, of, yeah. of Savages. And she's the shortest uh, um, drummer that you've ever seen. Uh, she happens to be female, but again, that, as I say, that never really matters. But she is just a bomb when it comes to playing um, drums. She's so good. It's quite aggressive, that music as well. So it's quite... She, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. She is the muscles on her. I mean, she... You know, I got talking with one time afterwards and um, where were we now? On um, Bankside on the South Bank uh, in an a outdoor um, bar yep. um, one summer. And I hadn't talked to her much and I sat next to her and we had quite a giggle. And I said to her, man, I, you, the, and I can't remember, she was. She said what symbols she was using and what she had. Um, but I said, the energy, I said, that gig, you just did not stop. It was relentless. And she just looked at me and just blinked and went, well, 
yeah, that's what I do. It's like a bit of a workout, but I kind of enjoy it. Yeah. And I know we rehearse, and that's what it's about. If you if you put the hours in rehearsing, then it's a bit like, yeah, you know, you do it for an hour and a half or whatever, and you know you know what's before you, yeah. and you know what's what you're going to expect, what your body's got to do. Yeah, yeah. Um, I always used to think that. I always used to say to, God, to, to, to some of the guys, two of us actually, we were from like more of a sport background in, oh, okay. in, yeah. in, in, in a bit of some aspects. One of the guys I was in a band with for a while was an ice hockey player. Yeah. Oh, and um, two of the other guys, or three, they, they were more, more mu- musical. Right. Whereas us, it was just like a workout. We'd go <laughs> in and it was, you know, yeah. and like playing a sport, playing football, playing hockey, you train all week mm. and you get used to. That's, having to control like something coming at you if it's a ball it's a puck or whatever yeah you have to learn to control it and the stamina to keep that going and for the that length of time going, yeah. yeah i find that in, uh, yeah i find that incredible and, and it, i don't know about you as well but i you know when you're one thing in the arts you're, you're always kind of curious about the other so i said to you earlier when you first came in here that you know i'm I'm not a photographer. Mm. And I find it fascinating that people can just pick up a camera and see something and through that aperture frame something in a certain way and take a picture and it's and it's captured saying I have the same equipment and you would you can say well hold on I'm I'm an artist so I should have that kind of um uh, that particular eye now I have a very quick hand and eye coordination I know I do because of doing my life drawing I can draw in two minutes I can draw a figure really yeah. really quickly and it, they won't be you know we won't necessarily be counting fingers but it'll be that figure in put in 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 pose I can do a pot portrait I can draw someone in probably in an hour, I can do wow. a portrait of someone very, very quickly. And um, uh, it's a, it takes a particular style. But I'm curious when you when I see a photographer and I go, well, how did you see that? I'm standing in front of the same temple, Angkor Wat, and uh, my then partner was going, yeah. And I'm going, look at that, terrific. Take a picture. It looks like any other standard, bog standard picture, yep. only worse, really. The lighting wasn't great. <laughs> and I've got a good camera. And then, uh, and then my partner would take the camera and she'd take a picture and she would notice something out of the corner of her eye. And it, it might be part of the temple or something, but it, whatever it is, she's captured something that I haven't seen. And, and I find that incredible. And the same for music. I listen to people that can sing. And I'm in awe of people that can sing. I'm doubly in awe of people that can not only one sing, but two, play piano or play guitar at the same time. I cannot get my head it's around the fact that this is two skills. This is singing. And I have Rebecca, a woman, Rebecca Tomasi, who discovered uh, singing only about seven, eight years ago. She didn't think she could do it. Got into singing and now she sings, mm-hmm. mainly jazz. And she sings in London. But she comes to my life during class. And she said, Marty, I can teach anyone. Anyone can sing. I can teach anyone to sing. And I went, well, you haven't heard me yet. And she goes, no, I haven't. But I mean, I could teach you. There are certain things you won't be able to sing because your voice will be too low or you might have a very high voice so you won't be able to sing such low songs. But um, I can definitely teach you how to, how to sing. It's just a, it's getting to you, you know, know how to use your, your voice and where to sing, whether it's where your range more is. Your, yeah, your range. And... Uh, I, that's fascinating and you know, I would love to you know we all think we're great singers if we're having a, in a bath in the shower yeah I mean I am Paul Weller but actually I'm not when it comes <laughs> down to it um yeah but I think that's the same with musical instruments and and that in general you can yeah. find your you can find your place yeah and that's the important thing of being in a band I think is when you know your your space yeah and when you're given that space to, to do, yeah. do your thing and, and you so you, were you drums first of all or were you guitar and then drums and then Played a bit of, played bass badly, um, or just, nice. you know, just got thrown in. And yeah. that was it, and that's how I got into music. And then, really? and then um, yeah, just just got into drumming by listening to the, by playing with the drummer and listening to where the bass drum fell. And then that's when I started to actually be able, because before then I didn't have any musical ear. I couldn't differentiate yeah. the instruments. Yes, yeah, um, yeah. And then I started to, to get a bit of a vocabulary, I guess, like of, of, what was an understanding what was going on and that's a switch on your brain it literally is something that just comes in to... just repetitive just mm. i think and just something just through wanting to dig in and and, yeah. and learn that little bit more and i wasn't and i'm not i'm not very good i'm still not very good mm. you know but i just learned to as a drummer as well i think i used to watch a lot of drums and it was just like especially like um 
in in small clubs and I'd be like why does this work or why doesn't it work mm. and often it was like the drums were messy or it didn't pull it apart and I used to think to myself oh you can do like I'd seen bands like Sonic Youth oh amazing and they they obviously use a lot of weird tunings yeah yeah and uh, a lot of that's rhythmic and you're like but the drummer's Steve Shelley is just very tight right and he doesn't like necessarily do anything that's like overly flash mm. but it just pulls everything together in yeah. such a way that everything works together and you think and it, I mean even with a band like the Savages as well it's yes a lot of those beats are really like pounding oh yeah know. they're real screamy some of them are yeah. a bit like um, Fugazi you know they're like two minute almost kind of orgies of shouting Fugazi Susie and the Banshees that's Susie Banshee yeah, yeah yeah exactly and I mean you know and it's funny you, you listen to some of these earlier bands like but the Banshees um, and they still sound quite relevant and modern now to some band, I, I listen to some bands and I go, well, you you must have heard, you know, so and so. You must have heard this band. You must have. Heard, you, there's no way you would have not heard that kind of music. And I think that's a great thing. I think that's really, really when you get into, and I, I don't really I fully understand this word, but the zeitgeist. Yeah. So when you actually tune in to something that's going on, whether it comes out in your music, in your writing, in poetry, in sculpture, um, or music. Indeed, any of the any any of the arts, it comes out in such a way because it's really relevant and it says something about the time. Um, that might, that's great. Yeah, you know, um, because then that's when you get noticed. I think because you're because you're being relevant mm. because you're just um, you're just there at the right time as well. You know, and um, yeah. And there's got to be some authenticity about it, isn't there? Yeah, right? definitely. I think, yeah, it's good. One thing, mimicry, you know, as we were saying earlier, I think that, um, you know, before we were, we were recording, um, it's good to to learn and to mimic and to play something similar. I go, oh, I really like the way that um, Muse do this. Mm. Or um, um, oh, who was it I was listening to, uh, which was brilliant the other day? Um, oh... OK Computer and Blue Radiohead. Radiohead. Yeah. They did a live, a live Radiohead. It, whether it's Radiohead or it was just him, but it was a band um, and they were playing and his voice was just beautiful and, and out of worldly and just <laughs> incredible. And you, you, you really had to hear it. Now that was, that I found incredible. And also I love it where um, I, I watched the... Um, the Beatles, and this is where I appreciate more Paul McCartney. I, I, I was again. I said earlier I, I didn't like Bowie, yeah. and now I love him. I absolutely hated Paul McCartney, right? You were more but of a I Lennon wa- man, were you? Yeah, yeah, I watched the documentary about the Beatles that was done by the same guy, was it Jackson, that did Lord of the Rings. He did like right. a four or five hour documentary that came out on I think Netflix eventually, and I Peter saw it. Jackson, yeah, yeah, and it's it's incredible, sure. It's really really good, but the 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 one bit that I really like, apart from keep seeing Paul McCartney really tying the band together and try and keep them focused, and he was obviously the kind of engine room of the band, I think, yeah. was um, when they isolated some of the different um, uh, instruments. So when it went into the recording studio and they're sitting there and then they're, they're, they're moving the different switches up and down and the you're, faders, yeah. you're, you're at the faders and you're just listening to maybe John Lennon singing. And then they take him out, and then they're just hearing the drums, and then they're listening to the guitar, and then they start to you know, overlap and overlap, and I love that. And of course, that's that's exactly what it's like when you're in a recording studio. You'll hear that, and you go, you know, if you've got a good ear, as you're saying, you might realise, well, you know what, we're, we need this. We don't have that as a hole there, or we need to repeat that bit there because we've got nothing here, and that that will work there. And they, you know, it's it's like putting together a sequence in a movie you know if you're listening to music i guess it becomes when you're creating the music a point of which you go we either we need this or we need something like this or yeah yeah have you heard that band that play that so you know black great they did this yeah oh right we need that like you know and then it's it's language language again comes into it he's painting a bit like that it, it, it can be um there's an internal dialogue in my head which is often uh, d- oh, damn, shit. Oh, no, it's not quite right. You know, a lot of negatives. But out of that push-pull comes, that's it. Now you're on it. And, and and I do find, actually, and it's like writing. What do they say about writing? The first maybe half hour of writing, sitting down and you make yourself write if you're a writer. I hear, this is what I hear. 
you start writing and you're writing and and you feel like you're not going anywhere you're just writing and maybe it could be sent towards the story it's the character and you're you're saying this is what the character's doing and this is what they'll do but yeah. maybe for the first half hour it is just um an exercise in just getting your hand in and getting the flow yeah and 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 after that what happens is like screw that up or put it to one side you're now You've revving up. You've got you've got that engine going, and there you're starting to work. And it's a bit like that with painting. I come in sometimes. I've got to set up my palette and get my colours right. If I'm doing a face, if it's of a, of a particular person or certain colours, I'll I'll put down those colours. I start to have a look at what I need to do, and I'll oil in if I if there's some of the painting needs oiling in. That's just a technical way of of it's difficult when you're doing oil painting to to put oil paint on dry oil paint. So often you need to oil the dried area if you need to mix it again. And, and, and so I need to do a bit of prep. Um, these all take a little while and they're not, are not as interesting as then, as then when you actually finally get into the driving seat and start, start working in what you need to do, whether it's underpainting or, or what we call first pass. So you, you, you do the underpainting and you do first pass. Well, that means you're getting a little bit tighter. Yeah. So if you're doing a, a face and you're a realist painter then that ear is looking more like an ear yep. um, and then the final pass is but at that point you're now finessing and you're trying to get the light right you're trying to just um correct any mistakes and um <clears throat> just get nearer to what you know you want so it's layer upon layer yes yeah yeah so it is um so yeah it's it's kind of takes a little while um but then you kind of get get into it and sometimes you can have bad days like anything you know you can come into the studio and just look at a painting and you just think, oh, it's not working. And I've never done it, but again, other artists I know would just turn that painting and face it, face the wall. They'll work on something else for a day or two or even a week. And then they'll come back and they'll turn that painting and have a look at it. And with fresh eyes, you go, yeah, there's something wrong with that eye. Mm -hmm. Or um, I'm not sure about the colour there. Or maybe I should do that a bit smaller. You just see it better. And I find that I can do that. I didn't think I could teach my wife's a teacher and she's been doing it for quite a few years yeah and she she teaches um f uh, year four so she's got seven eight nine year olds um she came to my life during class and i said to her well i'm not really a teacher well and she laughed at me and she said you are because you're going around and you're saying oh uh, can i just show you something and then you're correcting someone so you're showing them where they're going wrong correcting them and putting them right, right yeah. well that's what's called teaching martin and i'm going well okay but i didn't think i could do that because mm -hmm. i haven't actually been taught that but i have a set of eyes and i know my set of skills and it's and people can do that to me like i could be doing a drawing and you can come over Stuart, and you can and there might be something when well, it still happens there might be something wrong i might not quite have the length of that person's leg quite right yep. or i might not have the expression quite right but because you're looking at it with fresh eyes and you're looking at the model and you're looking at me or you're looking at the photograph and you're looking at, at my work, you, you'll you have something to say about it. And and that's because you're coming to it afresh. I'm just doing what most people can do, except I'm coming from a, a, a frame of reference, okay. uh, you know, which is all the history that comes from learning, you know, as we said, you know, 10,000 hours yeah. and just putting the graft in. If you do the graft, and that's why I always think it's funny when you're, when you're creative, when you're a, a musician or photographer or an artist, the thing that I get time and time again is it's not quite a proper job. And can you do mates rates? Like I'll do anything anyone. Anyway. Like I have yeah. no problem spending time with you here now. I have no problem doing a drawing or spending maybe a day doing a portrait of you for free. Knowing I'm not going to get any money for it, but knowing that I'm giving it a go and it's interesting for me and I'm keeping my hand and I'm learning. And at the end of that, I might give that, to you and you'll go well thanks that's nice hopefully <laughs> but like job done and i think um yeah it's just being able to to just um yeah just just do it and do the work yeah, yeah. of course so you were saying you obviously you like painting from when you was 11 yeah and then you went to camberwell so you you already knew what you wanted to do when you went there yeah totally i mean i was already then saying so i was kind of doing for my foundation before I knew what I was doing. So I was putting portfolio together of my drawings. I'd been doing some paintings. I'd mucked around with sculpture. It really wasn't very good, but I was mucking around with things. And I was taking some photos as well. And they were, you would laugh at some of the photos I took. I, I made a pinhole camera thing and I left it outside a pub. I went in the pub. Hours later, I came out of the pub, took the pinhole camera, covered it. 
and then um, produced these photographs of the front of the pub. Yep. And uh, that was my work. And it was slightly fuzzy with people walking <laughs> past, but it was all right. Now, I knew pub that I wanted to be, apart, apart from a pub goer, I wanted to be an artist. <laughs> So I had all this body of work. Then I went and did my applied for my foundation, which then they said to you, well, the reason why you do foundation, it's called foundation because it's the foundation of your art, whether you want to. We will look at you, the tutors say, and you have a sculpture and a photography and a printmaker and all these other people. I haven't even mentioned about printmaking, but you have all these tutors and they look at you, rinse you and see what you can do, make you do all these different things. And after they've juggled you, they'll go... Yeah, you're not really a painter or you're not really a photographer, but I tell you what, I think you're really good at sculpture. Mm. And that can have a kind of quite an effect on people because, well, I knew I wanted to be a painter and I was so adamant that that's what I wanted to do. I had such a lot of work. Then when I was at college at my foundation, I worked hard on everything. I knew I was weaker at some stuff, but I did give it a go because I may at some stage, and, and I did in the past actually, involve some 3D um sculpture into my paintings so i had um uh, i did a a whole project on the vietnam war and i stitched a row of um a a bullet belt and then i did a that's all folks from a cartoon i did a that's all painting and i i split the camera uh sorry the canvas and i pushed a a sculpture of um uh daffy duck coming out and and the right and that's all folks and i was trying to make a story of of how kind of wacky and how tv centered the vietnam war was and i was you know quite pop arty at the time so i was i was using different media but for my foundation um yeah you try everything and i was trying everything but i knew i knew i wanted to be a painter and no one was going to stop me and at the end of nine months they said we we advise you to be a painter. You you're obviously a painter, yeah. and that was that. I didn't have to try. I I kind of knew. There were other people there. Uh, one one chap I can completely remember actually, and he was devastated initially. But he was so good at sculpture, um, and he was a big heavy set guy, and he did this wood sculpture out in the yard. We had this kind of really old, crappy units of where we were at Camberwell, where we stored a lot of our artwork and where our spaces were. Um, He was out in the yard chipping away at this lump of wood and it was incredible. And out of that piece of work, he really got noticed. And the tutors at the end all said, you can't paint. You're not very good at photography, but I'll tell you what, you're very good with your hands and you've got a feel of the 3D. And I don't have much of an idea of 3D, but some people do. And I think, again, it's like hard wiring, whether you've got that kind of... um, uh, that view of, of as a photographer and I say I don't really have yeah maybe it's my impatience but but you know um but you have that and uh, so yeah I knew definitely I wanted to be a, a painter so I then did my foundation and then they went right well, you can either stop now but we advise you as we advise anyone that's done the, the foundation to do a degree okay. so do a BA bachelor's of arts and then from there you can do a master's of art MA. I didn't do an MA yep uh, but you can do a, a BA, and uh, the BA can be three or four years. It can be five years, in fact, if you do it as an adult student and s- spread it out. I did it in three years, though. And um, and I, that's when I did that just outside London in uh, in Farnham. Okay. So it was only, so Surrey Way, less than an hour away from London. Yep. It meant I could still go to gigs and be near my friends. Um, and Farnham itself had nothing apart from pubs. There's a bit of a thing that keeps coming back, but I had pubs <laughs> and they had um, shops and second-hand shops, which is perfect. So when you're a student yeah, you and you ain't got much money, things have got to be cheap. So you can clothe yourself quite cheaply and you can eat quite cheaply. It's just practical. And it's practical, yeah. yeah. And um, so I, you know, I did... Did you go... Did you do... Um, did you go to college and do your... Do, do any I, I started at University of Arts... Oh, right. London, as a mature student after after lockdown but it didn't quite work out for me right um it wasn't it wasn't so good no it was weird i'd kind of come out of a situation where life had been very strange bit hard, right? Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. and uh and went in there and then it was like nothing was going on i don't think they really because of covid being a new thing as well mm. they it was it was like watching a train wreck really really yeah, yeah. in some some aspects yeah yeah Mm, so it wasn't wasn't good, but um, but yeah, I 
you learn through those things anyway. You yeah, learn new thing. Yeah, I learned new things right when, when I was there. Maybe, but I mean, I think part of college uh, as a young man, you know, I was slightly older because I was about twenty three, twenty four. So a lot of them are nineteen, twenty year olds. Yeah, right. They are leaving banker mum and dad in most cases from all walks of life. Doesn't matter whether you're upper upper class, lower class, working class. You're thrown into the deep end a little bit because you you you're a blank screen. You kind of you're at that kind of think you know it all. Well, I was. I can only talk about me. You think, yeah, yeah, yeah. The life starts now. Well, it kind of does, but you are a bit of a blank screen. You verbalise stuff that you think sounds right. You think you know films and you can quote certain things, but actually you haven't you haven't seen life. So you haven't seen the, the, you know, the crap that's out there and everybody goes through life and it's not all roses and you have your relationships and you have your jobs that are good and bad and you lose money and you gain money and you have a bit of luck and you have a bit of bad luck and all that is life. And, and of course you need that. You need to get that, those lines by, you know, by your eyes Yeah, yeah. to, to be able to, and you know, and again, you, you never stop learning. So I'm always surprised. I'm surprised by some of the people I meet, by by people that walk into your life that somehow can improve it. And I don't mean necessarily um, in a physical term, in a physical way, but mentally, you kind of just go, there is a like a like minded human being walking the planet, at a similar sort of values and th- thoughts as me. Or there is someone that I kind of really want to emulate because they're really good at, at music or photography and right. make encourages me to want to improve my painting for instance um and it's very nice to have people that come into my studio being a no one and you know i'm, I'm by, by that again i mean i'm not a i'm not a, a, a jenny Saf or or blake or hotney or any of those you know monumental figures of art but um but i am part of the gang in that i do art so people come in and they're fired up and sometimes people leave the studio and they say to me, oh, wow, I'm so glad that I've come in. I didn't even know this existed, this place. It's like a little kind of wonder of a place. And I go, well, that's great because this is my life. You know, when lockdown happened, this was my studio, um, 20 Haynes Lane, my studio yep. <laughs> was um, my back cave. You know, it was my area, my safe space. And... Um, you know, we all like that. It's nice to have your your stuff around you and and being able to to create. Well, I think the experience, like you were saying, that was it was like that for me when I first came in here. Right. Like, wow. Yeah. yeah. But I just really enjoyed the art. I really enjoyed talking to you. Yeah. Um, well, thank you. And just looking at all, all of your artwork and going, wow, this this mm. is really really good. So, what happened when you left college? I mean, what 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 was the what was the plan or what happened what plan. just what happened well yeah well it's funny well here we go we're all great plans um uh net well t- here's the honesty here <laughs> so i all the way through my college i worked so i worked in the summer so i was a i was in farnham a lot over the summer i would i would go down to mum and dad and stay with them for maybe a week or so whatever yeah get a bit of food in me relax a bit they'd eventually get fed up of me i'll get a little bit fed up of them and then i'll either go stay with my friends in London or I'll go back to Farnham. And um, so, so, so yeah, every year I was earning money. So I worked as well as did the artwork. I also worked my way through college because mum and dad couldn't really afford to keep me in college. I had to do that myself. Yeah. So I'd spent a year or so before my foundation working in factory jobs, which I absolutely hated. But it actually, again, made me see a bit of life yeah. And get get be a bit more of a realist and go. Well, don't, you've got to work for your money, you know. If you if you want anything, uh, and you you've got to do it yourself, then you've you've got to do these things, you know. So it made you a bit made me a bit harder. So I did that. Worked in um an um uh, electrical trunking company, and then I worked well, I worked in a sawmill before that, which was freezing cold in the winter and oh, boiling off easy jobs, in the summer. No, yeah. no, no. I was um, a, a real rat. I'd go underneath the drill beds and I'd have to change all the drills and I was, was young and I was fit but I was small um I was a perfect size to go scrambling underneath machinery and uh and and uh we the, the, the drills and stuff so I did all of that got paid and then eventually went to to do my foundation so again when I did my degree I knew I had to work I did a cleaning job at the college which meant most mornings I was 
at college at seven in the morning. So I was there at seven. I'd do my two hours. I'd get paid at the end of the week. I can't even remember how much I got, but it was, it was pretty pretty good. There was a good cleaning crew. We all had quite a laugh. Um, and then, so then I was at college at nine o'clock. Well, that never happens. An art student in a in a college at nine o'clock, you are laughing because most of the people at art colleges they've gone out the night before. Twelve o'clock, get up. At yeah, it's it's middays when a day starts really, and um, so that meant I could do. I was so wired then that I could do my my artwork. So around about one or two, I could slow down. I you know, and so I worked this kind of not nocturnal. It was the other way around really. I was sort of the early bird. I was I was earning money. Then I was doing my coursework early on, getting that finished to the to the point where I was helping third year animation students with their there were their stop motion animation. I had time to help them, wow. so they dressed me up, and I'll have to do all these kind of very minute movements, and they'll do two clicks, and that'll be a second, two clicks, and then one minute is twenty five, twenty six clicks or whatever, and then I so I was a bit of a robot, and again I earned a bit of money and a bit of respect actually because the third years were were a really good bunch and. Um, uh, so that was good fun, and I felt like I was I was um, contributing a bit. And then the yeah, and then third year you're doing a final year, and you're just focused to do your degree. Yeah, so I'm working and I'm doing my degree, and then you're running, 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 bang, you finish. Mm. And then back to your question, what do you do? Well, it's a bit of a kind of whoa, what just happened there? You're at the other end of the tunnel. So I had to reevaluate. The first thing I knew is I had a key of money that I could stay in farming for a little while. But that wasn't the be all end all. I did not want to stay near Aldershot and be chased by a load of um, squaddies all the time. I, I, you know, as much as that was, you know, it can be fun. Um, It could be (laughs) scary. So I I thought, no, I want to go back to London. So I uh, eventually moved back to, uh, no, well, I'm trying to think where I moved now. I I went to Lewisham, I think it was South London or Catford, Catford Way. And, um, I'd applied to a few jobs and I got a job working at um, Design Bridge. Now, I'd already done a bit of work for Design Bridge beforehand, um, only a bit, but then I did a bit more work with them. Um, I was a runner, really, so it was yeah. really watching how people work. Computers were just coming in. How old do I sound now, then, Stuart? Macs were just coming in. And I was like, no, I'm not using a Mac. And I do use a Mac now for my illustration cartoon work. Yep. But at the time, I was a purist. No, I shall never touch a computer. And there were a load of guys and girls and Farnham that were using state-of-the-art new Macs. They were using this thing called Photoshop, which I'd never heard of. And, go, yep. and it was like amazing. Um, uh, so when I started at Design Bridge, I was a runner. Um, but I was only there for about a year and um, then I heard about another job and then um, I moved to them and, and that was uh, a company called One Together and that was a card manufacturing job and it meant I could do more illustration and more okay. cartoon work. And then I moved then to Shepherd's Bush. So it was probably, that was probably around about two years and then I was yeah in Shepherd's Bush, which I really liked. Nice, interesting area. Um, I could get into the centre really easy on the central line. Yeah. Um, I stayed in a garden flat. I was in a basement flat there. Um, and, uh, yeah, I was just getting back into things and doing illustration work. Then my final job, uh, final proper job, if you like, yeah. was um, working for a company called Elephants Can't Jump. Okay. All got funny names, but this was a, um, a brand marketing agency. And the reason why I got that job is I got them out of a... A sticky situation i i was freelancing and they needed someone to copy a particular style and it was um um manga style of like right. japanese style of joint which I, ha- I hadn't done before but i could emulate i could copy i could see they wanted they wanted a male figure a female figure a young girl a dog and a robot and an alien so they wanted six characters <clears throat> that particular style not only that they then wanted a like Cartoon Network style. They wanted a real realistic style. So um, they wanted like five or six different styles yep. so that they could get of the same characters to show that they could get an, uh, an argument across, uh, uh, you know, to help them with their marketing um, presentation. 
I did it all. I came in and helped someone that couldn't do it. And I ended up doing stuff. And then I was briefed incorrectly by a young fella called Will. I always remember he was a nice guy, but he one particular style, which was either a realistic style or um, there was one particular style he never told me to do, which was the important one. Right. And they were showing in about two days time. He got the rocket. He, he absolutely got bollocked. And then mm. uh, they then called me and said, look, well, we're really, really sorry, but we really need you to do another. It's going to be a turnaround. You might have to work in the night. Well, I didn't mind. I enjoyed what I was doing. I said, right. So what do you want? Send me examples of what you want. They sent me examples of what they want. Uh, and I went, yep, yeah, cool. I can do that. And I worked in the night. I worked over the night. Yeah. Next day, I walked up, said, here you go. Here's the artwork. And they loved it. And then they said to me, well, you turn that around really fast. I went, well, I didn't have much choice. You know? yeah. <laughs> One, you're paying me, but two, well, you've got a done. client that wants to see the work, so you've got to do it, you know. And um, then they said, what's your what's your feeling about working full-time? Would you work full-time? And here's where my naivety went in. I was like, yeah, of course I did. I want to work full-time. So I went, yeah, yeah. So they went, so, um, so if we offered you, and then they offered me a fee. Well, I wait, well, instead of I'm in mean, an eye, I went, yeah. And I went, okay, fine. Well, we'll send you a, we'll send you a, a, a draft of it, and you sign it. And contracts, uh, yeah. And when do you want to start? Well, I can start next week. I told my partner at the time, and she just looked at me and she was shaking her head. She went, "Tell me, Marty, you did not say yes to the first offer of what they offered you." And I looked in her eyes and I went, "Yeah, I did." <laughs> That's what I said. And she went, "No, no, call them up and say, look, you've looked at your incomings and your outgoings, and uh, you've decided that actually, I think for the hours that you do and the experience that you have." Anyway, I remember all those lines, and I was just listening to it, going, "That sounds so intelligent," and I was going, "Okay, I'll call them back." Yeah, call them back, mine. And I went, "All right." So I phoned up, and she was listening, and I went, "Oh, hello there. Hi, oh, is that Will? Yeah. Um, can you put me through to accounts and whatever and so so and so?" And they put me through. Oh, mine. You all right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I just had a little bit of a think and I went, oh, yeah. And I said, yeah, I was looking at my, and I looked at my partner and I said, I was looking at my ingoings and my outgoings and, and looking at what I do and my skills. And I basically was repeating what she said. Yeah. And they were laughing at the other end. And I said, okay, look, so what do you think is a good good figure? And I said, well, look, I'll email you what I think my hourly rate should be. Because yeah. I thought I'm still going to have to think about this. And then I did the good thing. Which I went online and you can look at people with um, age comparisons, compare, comparison sites to what you can do so uh, working in london you've got x amount of years of experience and you can do this what you're worth you yeah. know and i thought well i'm kind of worth this i might be able to pump into that but i'll start there so then i gave them the number and they went yeah straight away brilliant so i took that and then yeah. and, and you know and it did go up over the years i was with them for uh 15 years wow which is a long time. And uh, and that was 11, 11 or 12 years ago. Since then, I've freelanced. Yep. And uh, I would, you know, if there's an agency out there, I would say that I'm, you know, I juggle. So I'm, I am a full-time artist painter. I do do illustration work. So I just finished doing work for Fluet, uh, the, the people that do bags of salad and produce. That's I it. did. I just didn't finish work for Medicine Sans Frontières. So I had to do drawings of Kabul and um, uh, bomb sites and planes and maps and um, operating theatre and doctors and nurses. And that was really enjoyable. They gave me photos. I basically drew the, drew the photos. They wanted it drawn realistically. And I, I could hand draw that on my computer. And they paid me really handsomely. And I enjoyed it. But actually, um, I'm now at the point I got married to. Now, now uh, it would be coming up for two years in August. It's gone amazingly fast. And I and I think actually for my own sanity, it'd be good if I if I had more work. And I do find it hard freelancing. Freelancing is, is difficult because you've you know you've got to hustle. You've got to get out there. Oh yeah, hi I'm Martin. Yeah, I've done this, I've done that. I've I apply to so many jobs and I'm either too old because I'm 57 and I'm honest so I put on my CV what I am they look at all my all the clients I've ever worked for and I've got a lot of clients that I've done work for and they go all right okay so a lot of companies go well if we get Marty in he's gonna ask for a certain amount of money because he's got this amount level of skill yeah fair enough I can't change that I'm not gonna lie equally they could get Joe Bloggs who's fresh out of college and they can um 
manipulate them and turn them into whatever they want and they can give that man or woman a much lower fee and they'll be keen to to earn that because you know it's their first job and that's fine so i thought i've fallen through the gap slightly and that i can do the job but it's whether they want me to do it and uh and yeah. at the moment it's difficult because briefs for every, everyone you know are, are very hard you know you have one it's one getting the brief um it, and down the food chain i ha as a freelancer you're kind of much further down whereas if you're working for a company you know you're getting wage every month and you know the tax is all being sorted out and so um but then you know my other fear is if i end up doing a full-time work will that give me enough time to do you know to to do my portraiture and do my painting work i like to think that it would do i i mean i'm always painting but i'm get much more time now because yeah. i can organize my time and i can when the briefs come in i know i'm intensely working maybe for two or three weeks i, I did um something like 43 illustrations over a period of time it was quite a lot of hours of work but that's great because then i can i can put my hourly rate i can say these are the hours I've done for this, whatever, you know, and then um, and then luckily I get paid fairly quickly. The most, the hardest one is when I'm doing work for like the BBC or I've done stuff for, um, I'm trying to think for other people that I've done work for. Anyway, I, the, the bigger companies are the slow payers. Right. You know, you're slow, you, you're no one. You're hanging compared. around. You're hanging around. They wait, they make you wait the full month and they might go into the next month. Well, when you're freelancing, money counts. I mean, you know, I've got money at the moment coming in three different ways from my fine art painting, my portrait work, um, my life drawing work. So I teach life drawing once a week in yep. Crystal Palace. That's really good fun. I enjoy doing that. And I have 20 people come and I have a different model every week. And, I, and last year I did 48 weeks out of 52. Every Wednesday I, I taught life drawing. Um, and then my... Um, yeah, my other job is illustration. So those three revenues, now they're not all coming in at the same time. It'd be good if they would. It's sporadic. And my wife's a teacher, so she's working full time. She's on a good good wage for the years that she's been working. Um, but she's the real um, breadwinner of, 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 of us. Right. You know, uh, what I get is is okay. But I mean, I could be contributing more if I was working full time. Okay. Um, I guess Sergio's more got more of a reliable income. Yeah, in that, yeah. In that uh, aspect. Yeah. So, what what station did you get the studio, or was it before you when you were still working for? Uh, the... I've I've worked from home. That's a really good question, actually, because I was working from home. And the thing about working from home is, you well, first of all, you've got to have the, the space to do it. And then, well, what are you doing at home? Are you are you doing oil paint? Because if you're throwing oil paint it around, stinks, right? that's that's not going to be healthy in the house you're going to mm. live in. Number one, and, and if you own your own place or rent your own place, that's okay. But at the end of the day, you got to make sure it's clean when you move, and you got to live in it. Yeah. And and um, you know, as you know, you've been sitting in my studio for this length of time. You probably won't notice it, but the smell of paint is yeah. is in the air, yeah. and it can can um can affect you. You know, um, uh, but also the size of work you do depends on where you are. So when I was living at home and I had a smaller place. Well, the work I did was about the size that I could do on a table. So quite small. The biggest might be two foot by two foot. I'd be yeah. quite happy with that. Um, but then when I got my own studio, which was, um, I was living in Hiver Green. So I've moved in London quite a long time. Yep. But I, was, I lived in Hiver Green and it was in a factory conversion in a very big open space. And one corner wing of this massive space, this floor, um, I called my studio. Okay. And again, it had windows all the way around and it had a glass roof. And so in the summer, it was boiling hot, difficult to, you know, you could open the windows, but it was still hot. Oh, and in the winter, it was freezing cold because it was such a big space. Okay. And we were one of these early pioneers that we were asked to come in and look after these buildings until they were going to be turned into whatever they were going to be turned into. Like what these Guardian things A Guardian. I was a Guardian. Yeah. But uh, I wasn't wearing fancy clothing and, and trying to uh, help the universe. I was just trying to live. And um, so I was and in a paint. little room that was an office, really. And just outside my room was a sprung-loaded uh, dance floor with mirrors along one wall. And my flatmate, Reiko, um, a very talented ballerina, she would teach ballet. So I would come out of my room sometimes, 
luckily clothed. I'd have clothes on because I'd know. And there will be a class of maybe nine women in tutus all along what they call the bar doing stretching and then doing their practicing and whatever yep. just outside my room that was that was normal for me savages came the, the band savages right, imagine yeah. they would come and rehearse and that was funny because we had we they could bl- turn it up no one could hear us around where we were because it was such, so big and so high there's a lot of industrial space it's right? a big industrial space yeah. so they could um we had all the recording equipment in i'd just sit there and watch and they'd have drums way over there, they'd have so and so over here, so then they'd play, they'd jam a little bit and then they'd rehearse. So I got to see these three gigs, early gigs of Savages, and got to know them because they were friends of, of, of me and friends of friends. And um, uh, in that space was what I'd call a studio, and that was mm. my, my first proper studio. I exhibited there, I opened up the space so people came in. Um, we had a projection, so someone was showing a film, someone was showing some photographs, someone um, was a friend of a friend that did fashion. So it was really interesting. We did three, um, I can't remember what they're called now, but we had three openings, uh, Independence Day, we called them Independence Day. Okay. Um, and uh, three times we opened our, our space so that people could show their work, and, and me included. Um, but the studio I'm in now is my proper, proper studio. It's what you call a studio. And I only got this because I was stopped walking down the street in Crystal Palace. And I was with my partner then, who she was wearing a blue leather jacket and she had red hair. And I was quite moddy. So I was like, I had stripy red trousers on. I had uh, Converse shoes and a button down shirt. So couldn't miss you really. And I was walking down the road and I got stopped by a photographer called Corin yeah. and who became a friend and she said, Can I just have a quick word? And we stopped and looked at her and thought, Is she gonna what's she gonna try and sell us? And she said, um, I really like the way you look and I thought, Well that's flat no one's ever said that to me. And she said, um, I'm a photographer, can I take some photos of you? Um there's a studio just around the corner. I mean, um, I can't pay you, but I mean I, I can get you a cup of tea and, and if you want any photos I can I can print them and give them to you. So we looked at each other and went, well, we're not doing anything. Okay. So we went to what is now my studio, but it would wow. be next door, which is much bigger space. And um, she had a, she had it all set up. She had this big sheet of paper, white paper that was on a wall that was hanging yep. down, which was amazing because you, you could roll it out and it looked like infinity. Yep. And um, she had all this photographic stuff. And we just had to sit and smile at each other and uh, and look cool. And uh, And at the end of that... I had a couple of photos that looked really good. That were actually really, really good. Didn't I? Uh, you know, it just made me look. Oh, wow, that is that me? Mm-hmm. And uh, I said, "This is quite an interesting building. This it's you know, it's quite quite old. Um, are there any studios about?" And there weren't at the time. What? So I said, "Can you can you tell my name? Someone who was here I said, yeah. And actually, Florence and the Machine. So actually, Florence herself, she was here. She okay. was in a studio further down. This was before my time, but she had been in, and various people had been in, and and then um. I got a call one day, not long afterwards, saying, hey, are you still off the studio? And I went, yeah. But I mean, I'm working at home. I'm, I'm on Church Road and I, I've got, an, I'm in an old Victorian house, um, but I don't really want to get paint anywhere. Oh, you know, have a look at this place. And there was a woman in here who was teaching Reiki and hot stones, okay. which are hot stones was something like, what do you do with hot stones? I don't know. I now know, but I didn't know then. And... Uh, she the it was all painted sort of orange and yellow and it was really odd and she had a long bed like a table bed thing for massage and she had all these candles and things and i rocked up and she said i'm just moving i've bought my first house and i've got a spare room okay. and i'm going to use that room as a as my reiki so i, I don't have to pay rent mm-hmm. um do you want this studio? It's it's really cheap. It's going for X amount mm. a month. And I bit her arm off because it was so cheap. It's so expensive. I mean, especially now in London, yeah. a week, weekly prices are like 100 and odd quid. I'm lucky I'm much less. But I mean, it's an old old building but and it's only one room. I've got one long strip light and a window, but I've got enough light for what I need. Yeah. Um. So this is my studio and, and this is, my my I guess, my first proper studio but i've had it since then yeah yeah thank you it's a good place to work right yeah Yeah, it definitely is you know well my commute is eight minutes so i can fall out of bed my shower will take longer than me walking to here because it probably takes about seven minutes to get here and then i'm here 
sadly for my wife, she we, we both get up at six o'clock in the morning, about 10 to six. I make her breakfast, which is not that involved. You know, I don't do too much. See, normally toast or porridge and a cup of tea. Yep. But she's still waking up. She'll have a shower, whatever. And then she'll leave at like half six and then I'm up so I can do things. Um, it takes her, she works in the Barbican, so it will take her probably about 40 minutes to an hour to get to the, to the Barbican. Um, and that's her commute. She, she needs to take a bus and a, a tube train to work. Yeah. And I'm just seven minutes. That's uh, handy. You know, that, it, it's, you know, no complaints there, really. So if anyone wants to find you, yeah. For, for commissions or, or any work, illustration work or whatever. Yeah. So my email address is Martin Jessup 66 So it's Martin Jessup. So M A R T I N J E S S U P 66. So Martin Jessup 66 at gmail.com. That's my only email address. My fine arts art site uh, with my portrait work is Martin Jessup uh, 66 dot my portfolio so that's martin jessup 66 dot my portfolio dot com um that's my painting one and my illustration site is um paper and pixel creative dot co dot uk so paper and pixel p-i-x-e-l creative c-i-e-a-t-i-v-e um so paper and pixel creative dot co dot uk and um Oh, indeed, just type in Martin Jessup Artist and you you should see the links. And my last one, my Instagram is just Martin Jessup Artist. And that's that's my Insta. And then you can follow me from there. So they're all my Instas. And, but indeed, if you want to come to my studio, most Saturdays I have the door open. It's just the door. So people are a little bit nervous. They look at it and they see a sign saying, Art Studio, up this way. And then, you know, an arrow pointing up these dodgy stairs and it does look a bit like a backstreet abortionist or a tattoo parlor or a knocking shop it could be any of those things but actually it has a different kind of magic it has me and um you can see my artwork and chat to me and and uh yeah more than welcome to have anyone that's creative or not to come um a plus if you have a dog or a cat if you have an animal i love animals and people bring their dogs up and their, ch- and their kids doesn't bother me um so there's that and then finally yeah i teach my life join so my life join is every wednesday from seven till nine that's at the upper norwood library hub on west O'Hill in crystal palace so it's the upper norwood library hub um crystal palace and it's every wednesday from seven to nine is when i do my life join class and um uh, you have to email me to to book because i need to know figures but um Stuart, as I said before, you're always welcome to come along. I think I will, actually, yeah. Yeah, come along. yeah for sure. I've had some good models. Thanks, and Yeah, Mark. this has been really good fun. Yeah, thank you.